You, you are listening to, 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 to Product and Growth Show. So anyways, show. Uh, here we are. It's Product and Growth Show again. The episode number 85, which is a ridiculously big number. My name is Pavlo, so you guys should know me by now if you listen at least one of our previous episodes. Today, we've got Ryan joining us. Ryan led uh, multiple product initiatives at Karim. Uh, he built his own venture fund uh, called Outliers Ventures. Also, he's now leading product at one of the YC hottest startup called Kirkley. Ryan has a really diverse background. We met super randomly at the running club that a friend organizes and i'm super super excited to welcome him here today thanks for joining us ryan no thank you so much for having me what is the problem that you guys are trying to solve yeah so it's it's quite straightforward so um we're trying to make make sure that companies uh, we're trying to streamroll the the payroll process for companies in the middle east so that people are paid on time accurately and compliantly i think that's a, the simplest way to describe it uh we'll tap more into that later on but before we jump into the product and the problem and the market so you're very early you're an employee number nine in Kirkley, and obviously there are so many people who want to land a job in the fast growing yc company but very few managed yeah. to how did you even yeah. end up there yeah yeah so um so i started at Circly about a year and a half ago uh um, and to be completely transparent, I knew the founders and I had worked with the founders before. So I think as with anything in tech, a lot of it is built on relationships. Um, and uh, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to build a team in general. But I think, um, you know, going through the gauntlet with different people and knowing that you can rely on them and knowing um, their working styles makes it, you know, a lot easier to work with them again in the future. So I think um, when Akid and David founded Circly, they were looking for people that they could work with, um, uh, that they knew and that they could trust. And trust is a word that you know comes up a lot as we think about who we can work with, especially uh, when you're processing you know millions of dollars in payroll. Yeah, and obviously, like by by the moment you got an invitation to join the team, you've done a bunch of stuff. So what is that yes, that yeah. made you say yes? Uh, so, so transparently at the time, and we can go into this later, but I had, you know, I had done my six years in the Middle East. I had, um, I had been a VC twice. I had worked at, you know, what was at the time the hottest startup that was acquired by Uber, which was Kirim, which was, you know, our alma mater. And I felt like I had kind of done what I came to do in the Middle East. Um, you know, being Palestinian, I had a lot of connections to the region and, and, and was really excited to, you know, use technology to, um, uh, as we said at Kareem, simplify and improve the lives of the people uh, in the region. Um, and once I had done that, I, I chose London. Um, I was a recipient of the, the Tech Nation visa. And so I was moving here and Akita and Davida ha had approached me and they were, you know, kicking things off with Circly. They were, um, you know, they were doing their uh, discovery calls and, and meeting with folks and exploring if this was something they really wanted to pursue. And, and it came up, to, was I interested in working with Circly? And I said, you know, I would love to work on the problem, but, um, you know, I know that they feel very strongly about an in-office culture. And uh, I felt quite strongly about my move to London for various reasons. And so I didn't see uh, a path to working together at that point. But obviously, as friends, we stayed engaged and I was helping with a lot of things, um, ranging from, you know, kind of bringing my VC expertise to thinking through their next fundraise um to making introductions to folks uh kind of across the board and and so then it was just kind of a natural transition point i was doing you know i had took a sabbatical was considering a couple of other offers and they said why don't you try working with us remotely and um so that's why i'm based in london and that's kind of how it's moved forward since then and again that goes back to what i said earlier about about trust right there's uh, an element of you know we are not a we are not a remote first company um, but because I had worked with both the founders before, because they knew my style, because they knew uh, that I get things done, it made it easier to say, yes, we can bring Ryan on uh, from London and, and decide how frequent he visits. So that was kind of the genesis of how I came to Circle. And how does it feel to live between Dubai, between Middle East and London right now? Because obviously it's a bit of a commute. You know, I always complain when they make yeah. me go from London fields to Shoreditch, but it sounds <laughs> like a longer one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a slightly longer commute. It's about seven, seven and a half hours. Uh, look, it's it's honestly, um, it can be tough sometimes. I think, you know, I'm really lucky in that 
I work really well with the team online. And so my presence is obviously required um, periodically to, to, to build relationships with the team members that I haven't worked with before, um, but also to spend time in, in person with customers. So uh, it kind of varies. We have flexibility. Like, for instance, I haven't been in a few months because during the summer, obviously, things uh, quite literally heat up in the Middle East and people say, you know what, we're going to go elsewhere for the summer. So there wasn't really a need for me to be there in person. Uh, I'm going on Sunday because uh, now everybody's back and it, it makes sense to check in with the customers and and spending a lot of time with our customers as much as time in person as we can uh, and learning from them and working with them closely is uh, is one of our core values. So it's important that I be there. Obviously, you got such an unprecedented exposure to Middle East uh, tech culture. And yeah. now as, as you as someone who got the global talent visa, I feel like you should by now have a a decent exposure to what the UK tech scene is. So what do yeah. you think the main differences are? Yeah, look, I think uh, I would characterize them both as as nascent ecosystems when you compare them to places like New York or San Francisco. Dubai, I would say, is a little bit more nascent uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, it really only came about um, over the past, it, it came into being kind of over the past decade, right? Before that, there were VCs, uh, there were there were angel investors, and there were a few startups. But but the ecosystem has has really evolved. I mean, if you look at if you look at the genesis of the ecosystem itself, it really started around e-commerce and kind of bringing e-commerce to the Middle East and solving um, you know very transactional problems. Um, and you know when companies like Kareem started growing and attracting more talent, uh, and by talent I mean both engineering and and operational talent, uh, there was a network effect where these folks left and you know started uh, the, the the types of companies and the sectors that people were working started permeating, uh, permutating rather, and uh, and now you see you know crypto, AI, SaaS. Um, whereas again, you go back 10 years, you're going to see four or five permutations of, of e-commerce companies. Um, looking at London, to go back to your original question, I think uh, uh, tech ecosystems are built on talent, right? And I always said that I think building a strong foundation for tech ecosystem depends on, on the universities uh, and kind of the education within a city, right? Um, and you look at London, you can, some of the best universities in the world are based in London. Some of the uh, strongest research centers, uh, in, again, in different sectors are based in London. Uh, and off of that, you get brilliant minds that go on and, and build other types of companies, right? And, uh, and so I, I would characterize London by saying it's, it's a slightly more diverse and maybe more mature talent pool. Um, and they're solving for different problems. Um, a lot of the companies in MENA are solving for uh, what we used to say in, in Kareem is like, you know, uh, leapfrogging, like, how do we, how do we take 10 steps forward uh, to leapfrog what's being done and, and what's been done in other regions? Um, because again, you go back to pre COVID cash was still um, cash was still being used. And I don't want to say the majority of transactions. Um, I forget at which point we switched over. Um, but everybody was still using cash. Digital transactions were still uh, the minority. So I, I, again, I think we're you know the talent pools are different, and the um, and the problems we were solving were very different. Yeah, it just weird. I started to receive so many approaches from recruiters who hire for uh, yeah. companies based in Dubai, and I'm like. Can you not yeah. see on my profiles that I'm not based there? That's why I'm just wondering. It feels like something is brewing there, but just personally, I'd have yeah. zero exposure to the region. Yeah, look, and, and it's not just Dubai, right? Like, uh, and I think also, you know, we would be, uh, I, th I think it would be a, big, a bit ignorant to ignore the fact that there's a tremendous amount of capital flowing in the region. So where there's capital, people are going to raise. Um, and these countries are incentivized to move away from their traditional oil-based economies to more knowledge-based economies. And they see this as, you know, one attractive way to do so. Um, and also attract, you know, this, the sector itself attracts, you know, talent from all walks of life. So I think they see this as a, as a way to kind of transition their own economies, they being the governments. Um, but, but you also see it, um, 
you, you see it in smaller markets like Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Egypt. They they all have their own ecosystems as well, and you know they weren't traditionally um, living off of their their oil revenues, right? They don't have any to speak of. So um, it's it's really it's it's really interesting. Like looking at the evolution of Mina as a as a tech ecosystem is a really interesting thing to do because it's 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 just like you also can't consider the region a monolith, right? Like the support you get in Dubai and the infrastructure you have access to is going to be completely different from what you would get in Amman, Jordan. Um, and you're solving for different problems, but the talent pool, uh, in, in Amman or in Cairo, uh, for a specific functional expertise could be much stronger than you would find in Dubai. So it's, it's very, uh, synergistic, um, but, but each ecosystem is very unique. Thanks for unpacking that. Coming back to the the e-commerce space involvement. So obviously yeah. you led new products at Karim and throughout yes. these two years that you spent with Karim, what were the main evolutions that you experienced? Yeah, so I kind of uh, truthfully came in at, at you know, probably right before or just as Karim was uh, kind of evolving from that um, you know early stage uh gritty startup to more of a growth stage maturing company trying to find its identity but i felt like i was i was there at a really lucky time because it was when we started you know kirim had the name so going back to what i was saying earlier was able to attract really strong talent you know we were again the hot the hot startup to work for in the middle east and I think that that also gave us a room, you know, leadership uh, really wanted to experiment with doing different things. And so at the time that I was brought in, it was like, we have ride hailing, food is in the works. Uh, it, it was kind of its own thing being worked on, it had its own uh, org structure. What else can we do? How else can we commercialize our, our product and, and build new things? Um, and so I feel really lucky to have been there at that time where they said, you know, I had a lot of uh, leeway to just go figure things out and test things and break things, which I did. Um, and some of the products I launched were uh, incredibly unsuccessful, and and some of them are still very successful today. Okay, what was the most unsuccessful things that you launched? <laughs> Probably notoriously roadside assistance. Uh, so the idea there was, you know, we wanted to grow the product, uh, both in terms of users and in terms of revenue, right? But the idea was kind of the precursor to what became the super app. And the, the talk of super apps has died down a bit. Uh, but I would say from like end of 2019 to 2022, uh, emerging economies were very hyped up on super apps. You can do everything in the super app. You can pay people in the super app. You can get a cleaner for your house and the super app you can do ride hailing food whatever you, they wanted it to be uh one app that you use for everything so we said okay who are the people i said who are the people that are not using kidding today uh being that our business was mainly ride hailing it was car owners right because unless they were going out and uh you know they didn't they wanted to have a drink and didn't want to drive they were mainly using their own vehicles so what are the services that we can provide for cars and Dubai being a very service oriented economy, there were lots of offline players offering battery changes, you know, for because batteries tend to uh, die quite quickly in the summer, or flat tire changes or um, jump starts, again, going back to the batteries. Um, so we unfortunately had uh, limited product support. Uh, but but I hacked together something that that works, I hacked together a product that you would go in, you would click roadside assistance, um and basically it would we i went and trained a fleet of i think at the time like 20 30 uh roadside assistance vans from different companies i aggregated all the supply put them on the app trained them uh and you would call and and they would show up and they would say okay what's the problem oh i need a jump and unfortunately our you know again our payment infrastructure wasn't quite there and, and we had some challenges so you would have to pay them directly but again the idea was how do we how do we grow the app with users who aren't traditionally using Kirim? um it, it worked a bit but it just it didn't stick uh, and to be fair neither did a lot of the other businesses that that built this as a standalone business um so i think eventually it was shut down i'd characterize probably our most successful new venture was we acquired a, a bike sharing company, uh, not unlike Santander Bike here in London. Uh, we relaunched them as Kirin Bike and they were massively successful. It was the first public, I think it was the first 
large scale bike share program in the Middle East. And one of the first public private partnerships uh, in it was the first public private partnership in mobility because we did it uh, obviously in cooperation with the government of Dubai. You know, we needed permits and everything and, and sign off to set up the stations and the bike infrastructure, etc. So there was a lot of collaboration with the local government there. Uh, so I'd say those are that was kind of the, the two ends of the spectrum when it came to new ventures. Like you mentioned it yourself, it feels like this super app trend is winding down. Is it still cool to build a super app somewhere in Middle East, or is it still cool to do it in in Southeast Asia? Yeah, yeah. I think I think look, uh, these companies were looking for uh, marketing efficiencies and to optimize the real estate in their app, right? So if you're paying. Um, you know, uh, let's say you're paying a pound to acquire a customer. Do you want to acquire them so that they take, you know, four rides uh, a week? Or do you want to acquire them so that they take four rides a week? They send uh, 10 payments. They, you know, order food six times. Uh, and, and that was the goal. I think, I think these services are slightly commoditized and that made it really difficult. Um, that made it, it really difficult to retain these customers for all the services, right? It, think about now when you go out uh, in London, right? You're coming back, it's two o'clock in the morning, you're leaving a, a pub or wherever you're out. Uh, you don't care if you're using Uber or Bolt or Free Now. Wh whoever you just want to get car. home. You, you just want whoever gets, gets you a car, right? Um, and obviously that's an extreme case, but but you can extrapolate that to food delivery, right? You're looking for the best restaurants um, or your favorite restaurant. And so I think, and of course they tried to address this with uh, loyalty programs and, you know, uh, creating more value. So at, at Kirim, we had something, we, we still have, and I still say we, because we're always still part of Kirim, but we have something called Kirim Plus where... Um, it's similar to uh, Uber's loyalty program. You get discounts on on your Kirim bike membership. You get, a, I think it's like 5% off X number of rides on Kirim, et cetera. I think, I think the age of super apps has uh, kind of failed. I'm not super optimistic about it. And I think people have, I think companies have realized that that's probably not the way to go and they're just going to focus on a few services and doing them really well what makes you think that they realize that i mean for, for kareem as far as I, I and again like the the super app came after or like it started whilst i was there and and kind of died down after but it stopped being the selling point right i know they had looked at and or acquired a few companies in different sectors to try and build the super app We had spoken about it quite a bit when I was there. There was a lot of strategic thinking around it. Uh, again, my first role was the precursor, which was like, how do we, how do we add new services to Kareem to keep people using it and spending their money through there? Uh, but I don't think that they've taken it further. So, for example, Kareem did car rentals. Um, they did they did a and and there was always this buy versus partner um, buy versus partner with. Uh, a third party discussion, you know, so I think for uh, in Dubai, it's quite easy to order a cleaner on demand, right? A house cleaner. So they went and part partied with a partnered with a third party on that one. Um, and they did the same thing for um, um, car rentals. Like you can rent a car in the Kirim app, which I think you can also do in Uber. Now Uber has Uber boat here in London, right? But beyond that, I don't think that they forayed any further. They explored any other partnerships. They didn't really build anything else out. And from what I've seen, the you know, again, more from the outside now that most of us have left Kirim, so I don't have, I'm not as in close touch with the team. They're focusing more on payments, right? Because um, there's there's just more money to be made in payments. Uh, so Kirim is doing remittances now, tackling, you know, they they got investment from what is effectively a quasi-state-owned telco in the UAE, uh, which gave them a lot of leverage when it came to uh, working with highly regulated uh, activities such as remittances, especially when you're talking about the UAE. Remittances are extremely regulated, um, as as you probably know from, from your previous life. And, um, and now they're doing remittances to Pakistan. So I think it's probably like the... After Philippines and India, it's probably one of the largest 
uh, quarters from the UAE, at least, when we're talking about remittances. Uh, and so they're focusing on that. How do we capture value from people moving money versus, you know, let's have a team that's doing food. Let's have a team that's doing bikes. Let's have a team that's doing that. So I, I, that's my impression. But to be honest, I, I haven't followed it quite closely. It's quite a transformation. I was not aware of that. Uh, yeah. I have never heard they started the remittance. And it sounds like yeah. it's so far from their initial idea, right? From their initial yeah. problems that they were trying to solve. Because for me, it feels like building a payments yeah. business is a completely different thing if you compare it to building a ride hailing business. Well, I, w- I would disagree because I think, I think it's very complementary. Um, and especially when you think back to what I mentioned earlier and that the Middle East still is predominantly using cash, right? Um, we, one of the ways that we differentiated from Uber very early on, and I don't know if it was Travis, but somebody in the Uber leadership was mocking us saying like, oh, these guys are idiots, is we started accepting cash payment for trips uh, in, in the Middle East. And obviously, cash is very difficult to manage. Um, there's you have to allocate, um, you have to make allocations for losses. Uh, it's it's expensive to manage. So that's why Uber was kind of laughing at us, like, "Oh, who are these idiots thinking they can do that?" But it worked really, really well, and it got to a point where you could get in, and if your trip cost, you know, twenty five dirhams, which would be roughly five pounds, uh, and you only had you know, three tens, you could give the, the, we call them captains, not drivers, you could give the captain 30, and he could add five dirhams to your balance in your account, right? Um, and if you're holding value, if you're holding value in that wallet, uh, if there's stored value uh, for the users in the app, where are they going to spend it? it? There's a lot more friction to withdraw. I, I mean, now it's a, it's a lot better. But at the time, there was a lot more friction to withdraw. I think actually you couldn't withdraw. You had to spend it in the app. Then you say, okay, well, I have five dirhams extra in the app. I'm going to go order food now that I'm at my office. And everything you're doing in the app is is spending cash. Well, guess what? Also in the UAE, there was no efficient way to to send peer-to-peer payments there was you know anytime i i distinctly remember this i messaged we would have to share ibans right obviously here in in the uk you know companies like monzo have fixed that or revolut have fixed that where you can just look up somebody's name but back then we would share ibans and i distinctly remember one time messaging a friend i owed her some money for a dinner or something and she sent me a google uh google doc with all of her accounts listed and it's like oh if you're sending me dollars please send it to this account if you're sending me um, Dirhams, here's my IBAN and my bank information. You would have to go copy and paste it in, save them as a beneficiary. The bank would make you wait two days before you could send it. So there was a lot of friction. Now, Kirin Pay works just like Monzo here. It's instant uh, or Venmo in the US. So there's that movement of money you're capturing. And and um, and I, I think it's very complementary to what they do. But it's uh, it is a very difficult business. Well, how would you describe their product culture in general? Because obviously we have so many PMs who will listen to yeah. this episode and they have never heard, they, they have probably never met anyone who worked in the Middle East. So yeah. how, how, would you, how would you describe their product culture? I think it's very difficult to describe what the product culture looks like today because I'm, one, because I'm not there, but two, because I think the company is a completely different company. You know, pre-acquisition, it was a lot more gritty. We, we figured out how to hack things, the things that even some of the things that I did with that roadside assistance product uh, were quite hacked to the point where I had directors of the company calling me saying, what, what, what do you think you're doing? Like, this is not the best customer experience. And it, it was, we were testing things, right? Uh, I think as the company grew, as with any, you know, large tech company, a bit of bureaucracy seeped in. And I've heard this isn't, uh, this isn't something that I've seen directly, but I've heard that it's, it's a bit more product management has kind of transitioned to uh, project management, which in my mind is, you know, more or less the death of, of product management. But I, I, I can't say for certain at this point. So after I left Kirim, you know, COVID was happening. I was kind of unsure of what I wanted to do. Do I, am I ready like emotionally and mentally for another startup or do I want to continue working with startups and kind of being in a more supportive, supportive role? Um, and so uh, I was contacted by uh, somebody in my network that came through um, people I trusted um, and he was setting up a fund uh, to be based in Saudi 
but he was looking for somebody to work with him who had a lot of experience building companies and also in the regional ecosystem. Uh, and my name came up because I had spent time with what was one of the first VCs in the Middle East. So there were three in the Middle East. It was called Wamda Capital, Beko Capital, and Middle East Venture Partners. Uh, so I was at Wamda Capital. Um, so I had kind of like worn both of those hats, made a lot of sense. We we talked over a few calls. Um, it seemed that like our visions were aligned and, and kind of how we wanted to do things differently was, was aligned. Um, he had previously been um, in a government role and, you know, dabbled in, in, um, uh, dabbled in some regional startups, uh, both by angel investing and kind of working on some things himself. And he had a technical background. So it made a lot of sense at the time. Uh, and, and strangely, at that time, my decision point was, do I want to do this or do I want to move to London? And if I'm being truthful, it was you know, kind of that risk adverse mentality that some of us developed in COVID where it's like, I'm just going to stay put uh, and and do what I know for now. Uh, and then, you know, once the world is back to normal, I can, you know, breathe again and think about what makes sense. Um, so, so that's how I ended up there. How would you describe your experience comparing to being an operator? I have a lot of opinions on, on venture capital in the Middle East. And I think that I don't want to characterize everybody the same because I think there's a lot of great VCs. A lot of them are good friends. But I think in general, there's this, and this is actually something I see in common with some European ecosystems. There's this kind of unfounded, uh, I'm going to use the word arrogance, that, um, you know, you have these guys who have managed to raise, you know, 30, 50, 100 million dollars, um, but have no experience and no empathy for founders. Um, and they sit, you know, they sit there and, and it makes it very difficult to work with other VCs and it may, makes it very difficult uh, for the founders to work with them. And kind of being being a partner at this fund and kind of looking out over the ecosystem and, and seeing that, um, you know, the way that a lot of these VCs were working with the startups, it was a bit, um, it was a bit concerning. And uh, I just felt like at that point, my, there was a question of values too, right? There was a question of values of like, if this is representative of what VC in the Middle East is, this is not what I want to be associated with. Uh, so there was a values thing. And also, I think standing on the sidelines, writing somebody a check for two, three million and saying, best of luck, please call me at your next round. Uh, or if you need an introduction, and it's uh, it's very unfulfilling, if I'm being honest. Like, I would rather be out there working with the company helping them solve problems. But naturally, if you're a founder, you don't want your investors sitting there over your shoulder being like, how can I help? How can I help? So, so it, it kind of, um, you know, it was, it was a great learning experience. It was really interesting, but it wasn't uh, what I felt my calling was in life. And I think strangely, there were a few other VCs that, you know, friends that after I left, they kind of realized something similar. And I think it was a global phenomenon, to be fair. Like, I think there were a lot of people who thought VC is this sexy fad job. And I'm, you know, going to go sit work nine to five and write people checks and, and go to fancy dinners and, you know, you know, raise millions of dollars. And they don't realize that like, that's, that's it. You please stay on your side of the table. We'll call you when we need you. And, uh, and, you know, you're not part of the action. You're not part of building the company. You're just, you're, you're very much on the outside as much as you want to be, even if you go in with the best intentions and you say like, I want to be there with you day in, day out. I'm your partner. We're in the trenches together, all this rhetoric. There's only so much you can do. Imagine you're giving advice to someone who wants to raise in Middle East. Yeah. Uh, where should they start? Imagine in their early stage, let's say they have an idea or yeah. they even have a working prototype. They've got the basic team and they want to go to that market. Who does it, who do they need to approach? How do they need to work on their investment uh, investment strategy in order to be successful in attracting external funding? Uh, I, I think it's used across every, every market, but there's this famous saying of like VCs, early stage VCs look at a team and TAM, right? Like what's your market and what's your team look like? Um, and I would add to that, like, what's, what's the problem you're solving? Cause I think probably 95% of the businesses that approached me across both of my VC roles, they weren't really thinking about the problem. They were thinking about the solution. Uh, and this is where there was a crossover between what I learned as a VC and what I, what I took into product. So many people started with, I, you know, people come to me, I want to build the next Google. Well, why do you want to build the next Google? 
or uh, I'm going to, I had one guy call me from, uh, not to pick on country, I had one guy call me from a, a certain country in the GCC, and he said to me, I, I'm going to build the next Kirim. I said, okay, how are you going to build the next Kirim? So I, I'm going to raise money and I'm going to build it. I said, but why do you want to build the next Kirim? I will have better service. So, okay, how are you going to compete? The app will be better. So this person was just approaching it from the sense of like, I just want to build what's already been built. So I want to, I, they're not going at it from the right reasons uh, versus the most successful founders I saw and kind of tying it back to, to Circly, they started with a problem and said, how can I best fix this problem? Or can I even fix this problem? Is this something that can be addressed or is this systemic uh, is, is now not the right time? Uh, so I think finding that problem, putting the team together and ensuring that solving that problem is you know, financially rewarding is uh, if you can answer those three questions really, really, really well, it doesn't matter how fancy your pitch deck is. It doesn't. Sometimes I saw companies raise, you know, over 10 million without a proper pitch deck. It's just that's who you have to go to. And with respect to investors themselves in the Middle East, um, the best advice I can give is do your due diligence. Like you talk to 10, 15 founders, you'll start to see a pattern very quickly of who are the people you want to partner with uh, and who are the people that you want to stay clear of because this is this is a long-term relationship and it's it's an important one. You're, you know, I've seen them go sour and you're with these people for 10 years uh, and it's very difficult to remove somebody from your cap table you can't just call them up and say, hey, look, this isn't working out. You go your way and I go mine. There's there's a financial interest there that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, so definitely do your due diligence. What made you quit this job? What made you quit it and join a startup that was obviously and still is promising yeah. and is growing quite well, but also you probably now have way less fancy dinners to go to and probably your yes. job is not necessarily nine to five anymore. Yes. So yes, what... all of the above. So two things. So there's one thing when uh, there was a period again where, where VC was a fad uh, and I would get a LinkedIn message like every couple of days, either from uh, an alumni of my MBA program or a friend of a friend or somebody randomly reaching out over Twitter saying, I want to be a VC. How can I be a VC? And I would, I would tell them like, look, the best way for you to be a VC is for you to go build a company first and then come back to being a VC. Uh, anybody can be a VC. The math is monkey math. It's, it's quite easy. Uh, it's especially at an early stage, it's relationship building, which anybody can do, but it's really hard to build a company. And it's once you go through that one, you have way more empathy Two, you have functional expertise that you can share with these companies. Oh, I, you know, if, if a founder came to you today and said, Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of building a remittances business based here in London, you would have a lot of input into, uh, how they're going about that and what they're doing. And I think, um, and I think for me, I just didn't feel like I had enough of that experience. You know, I had done an investor role before. I was a consultant before that, which I don't count as a real work experience. And I wanted to actually, you know, I hate the term, but be in the trenches. And so it made a lot of sense for me to go back to building. And I wouldn't rule out being a VC again in the future, but I think VC will change as a, um, as a job. And I think then I'll be a lot more ready for it. And I can add a lot more value to any companies that I may invest in. Yeah, fair enough. And also, I feel like it's really important to care about what you're solving for. If you just don't feel like you have a personal attachment to the problem, or you don't have any empathy towards you toward the, towards people who will benefit from this problem being solved, then it's really hard yes. to keep yourself up and yes. running whenever things go south. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think. I, and I think. On this, I was almost overly empathetic at times, where I found myself siding with the company. When I had a, not that I ever violated my fiduciary duty, but I found myself thinking like, oh, it would be better for the company if they did this, but it's better for me if I do that. And I found that that there's a conflict there, uh, but ultimately, I believe that you know investors who do right by their companies uh, will always benefit more financially in the long term. But I just, I felt like I needed to be there with the companies, building the companies rather than sitting on the outside watching. 
Thanks for being super transparent. It's super interesting to learn about your journey because um, in my network, yeah. I see a similar trend. People who were successful operators, they they look for their ways to get into VC, which I personally yeah. don't think is a very exciting opportunity for someone who is probably a bit more early in their careers, let's say individual yes. contributors levels, where you still have to sort of build things, you know, and you can you still yeah. have energy to build things. And but at the same time, obviously I think there are profiles for both industries, right? And it's not about your age and it's not about your background. Um, but I made I made a really an well, what I thought was a really clever analogy once and somebody corrected me. I said being uh an operator is like, you know, uh being on the football pitch and playing football. And being a VC is like being the coach. And somebody came once and they corrected me and said, yeah, but you're not even the coach because you're not making any calls. You're sitting in the stands and you're literally cheering them on for the stands because you have no input at the end of the day on, on you know, uh, how they play or which player is being put in or which player is being taken out. You're just sitting and watching. Uh, and I thought that was quite profound because I thought that, that that was really what I was feeling. And I didn't even realize kind of how far from the pitch I was. Uh, so yeah, I, I still think that's very applicable to the to, to these types of roles today. Coming back to Circly, do you feel like you have a personal attachment to the problem? Because obviously you've spent so much time in the Middle East and it feels like yeah. you should understand this problem pretty well because why does yeah. it resonate with you? So uh, first of all, I like getting paid my salary. So, so that resonated with me. Uh, I, I preferred that I was paid for every month that I was working when I was in the Middle East. So I saw, I saw the inefficiencies of payroll from the receiving end, right? Uh, as an employee at Kirim, as an employee at Womda, um, and in, in outliers. And then, uh, you know, being in a leadership role at, at Kirim and interacting with the people team and seeing like where there were sticking points on payroll, even though I didn't have kind of the, uh, even though I wasn't involved in the payroll processes, I saw when I knew when there was issues, general issues. Um, and I, you know, kind of wrote these off as like, oh, well, we'll get there one day. It's just, you know, um, it's just this, you know, startup life. And then actually, I was the one that was processing uh, the the first real pain point I had, uh, kind of on the on the on the side of of payments, was I was the one helping to process the um, the funds when we were acquired by Uber, right? So there were cash payouts, uh, and I was responsible for uh, for making sure that everybody we had a, a long list. Uh, that the lawyers drew up of everybody who they were, who was getting paid and how much. And I was sending, you know, at that time we were, you know, uh, um, seven years old uh, and I was sending payments, you know, people had left, alumni were scattered all over the globe, the US, Europe, Australia, Canada. And I was sending these payments everywhere and lots of them were bouncing uh, and people were really upset about it because some of them were getting, uh, these weren't insignificant. These were, these were substantial payouts that some people were getting. A lot of people made millions of dollars. Um, and so I saw firsthand what that was like from that side. And then at Outliers, I saw what it was like when, you know, I kept, my partner was responsible for the payments uh, for salary. And obviously quite early, it was just he and I. And then as the team grew, there were more and more. And I remember, you know, trying to get his attention at the end of the month. And he'd say, I'm sorry, I have to spend a few hours doing payroll. And I'd be like, that's, that's crazy. Like, there are systems that have done this. There must be local players that do it, even if the international ones won't work. And there was none. And that's, um, and so I, I had a lot of empathy from both sides for the problem. And I saw what a, what a massive problem it is because everybody needs to get paid. That's, that's, that's our livelihood. Um, and this is kind of, you know, this was something that, that also led a key into, uh, into identifying this problem. I think going back to what I was saying earlier, he had thought a long time about starting a company, but he was focused on, is there a problem that I feel uh, vested in or interested enough in to, you know, spend the next 10 years of my life solving for it? Um, and he tells the story better, but, you know, he was at his, uh, after Kirim, he went on to another MENA-based unicorn called Kitopi, it was cloud kitchens for the Middle East. And they had, 
they were going through a similar kind of much, 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 much larger scale thought process that I had gone through at Outliers, which is how do we efficiently pay people? Uh, and the data was everywhere. And um, I think at the time they were, uh, they were already or they were thinking about um, working with Oracle. Obviously, uh, large scale ERPs require a lot more investment of time and, and financial investment. And so they were looking for how do we make sure, you know, effectively what I said at the beginning of this podcast, which was how do we make sure that people get paid on time, accurately and compliantly. And, um, and it, it, it went from there. Uh, and so this is a, we found out, um, you know, in discovery that this problem was much, much bigger than we thought. And it was crazy. The stories that came up in discovery when you're behind closed doors talking to a friend at another company and you hear, oh, these guys left the company. Uh, we were managing payroll on a Google sheet and they were paid for six months after they left because uh, nobody removed them from the Google sheet. Or um, yeah, we heard lots of, of stories of people you know, being fined because they thought they were paying people correctly and then they find out last minute, oh, actually we're not. And, uh, and it's really interesting. That's why you know, I'm, I'm sharing those three kind of tenants, the compliance piece is massive for the Middle East. Like it's, it's a very, very heavily regulated uh, region, doing something wrong can be very costly. And especially if you're a young startup, like it, you know, a lot of our customers are, are, are startups at the moment. And, uh, and, in, you know, not following the rules could, could be detrimental to their, let's say, longevity. Obviously, you are now a successful startup, right? Because you raised quite a bit of money recently. Well done on the four millions round. Um, some big dogs invested. Thank you. Uh, some Thank you. big industry stakeholders invested, and you, as an early employee, still leads their product. Uh, how does it feel to lead the product in the company uh, that is on that trajectory? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it like leading the product, right? Because I think uh, one, we have a very flat hierarchy, and two, um, I work quite closely with the co-founder David, who, um, you know, he ran product at Kareem for a bit for the food side of things, um, but he's, you know, he's also an engineer, so he spends a lot of time, kind of wearing two hats of like he's, you know, leading on product, but also. Um, you know, the head of engineering slash CTO role. So I think um, what my role effectively is, is uh, yes, I'm a PM, um, but I'm kind of the go-between between operations and product. So I spend a lot of time working with the customers and then going and feeding that back to the engineers, working with David on how do we solve for these problems? Um, how do we, uh, how do we prioritize them? And so it's, it's, I thought when I started, it was quite unique, but actually these things are so tied together that especially in a business where there's, there's still quite a bit of operational work to be done. And so we benefit tremendously from it because we're so focused on the customer experience and listening to our customers. I, I, I do what every product manager should do. I sit and I spend time and I listen to the customers and I, I, I receive their feedback. Uh, and then I figure out how do we, how do we prioritize and feed that back in? So it, it, it feels great to answer your question because uh, I think, I think it sounds so simple and so straightforward, but so many companies forget that that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I won't lie. There are times where like we've gone off and, and tried to start building something because, you know, maybe we made a false assumption and then we get a little bit further down. We say, wait, 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 let's, let's talk to a customer. Let's test this. That's this. And then we come back and say, Oh, I actually, this isn't as big of a problem. We thought, or actually this isn't the right solution. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about being close to the customers. Yeah, obviously at this stage, everything is really conviction dependent, right? There, you yeah. cannot run a proper A-B test or you cannot do a lot of experimentation because you simply don't yes. have enough traffic to run this. Exactly. How many engineers do you have at the moment? Um, I think we're officially 11 or 12 people now. And I think, what's the count? Like seven are engineers. Yeah, so uh, it's still a relatively engineer. small team. It's still a relatively it's small team. It's a relatively team. small team. We are hiring engineers, so I'm going to make that pitch, uh, especially for folks that want to move to Dubai. We, we, from the start, have had that strong focus on we're building a product, we're not building an ops company. And I think 
you know, I don't want to go back into the VC saga again, but I saw a lot of companies that, you know, would put together a shiny front end and then sitting behind it were a lot of people doing uh, manual tasks. That's, that's our ethos. We're, we're, we're building a product where we're uh, engineering focused. Yeah. But at this stage, how do you decide what to build next? I, I private, like I think of what we call uh, P zero, anything that affects payroll and we, you know, obviously our, our, it's very, our work is very cyclical in nature because we spend a lot of time, we go through a payroll, we identify, you know, challenges, uh, and then we try and quickly solve them before the next payroll. So that's how I kind of prioritize. Um, again, we call that more or less P zero. And then me personally, like the next level down, I think about, um, uh, what are, potential future data integrity issues and how can we solve for these? Uh, so I don't think about it in terms of like our customer wants this feature, they need this feature. I think about how do we make sure that the data we have is clean and stays clean um, so that we know what whatever features we have are accurate. Again, how do you pay people on time accurately and compliantly, right? Um, and, then, and then it's a bit of a it, it, it really depends. I think we have so many initiatives happening right now in terms of like uh, engineering initiatives and uh, new features that are coming out. We, we, we really just spend a lot of time. I go sit with a customer. I get on a call with a customer. I've, I've flown to another country just to sit with a customer and understand like, okay, you're doing this for the first time. Show me how this works for you. Show me how you did it before. Oh, wow, that's a mess. Um, it sounds, you know, uh, tell me a little bit more about this process. And then we go back and dig digest it. And we look across all of our other customers and say, like, okay, we've seen, you know, for, for time off management, you know, six people have asked for this or for reports, you know, our three biggest customers uh, need this. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, really driven by, I don't want to like harp on it or sound like a broken record, but it's really driven by what our customers are are telling us. Yeah, and I think it's a very smart way to prioritize it at this stage because I feel like so many startups who are very early stage are trying to invest, uh, are trying to invent a very robust prioritization framework, you know, put tons of metrics into yeah. it, figure out like how to prioritize based on these metrics. And then they spend more time prioritizing and pro more time discussing than yeah. building. And whenever yeah. I hear stories like that, it all comes down to the fundamentals, right? Sit with your customers, figure out what they need, what problems can you solve for them and solve them, right? But what's interesting is I think our risk is not that we go off and do this. I think our risk is like our uh, not a risk i would say our roadmap is so clear because we spend so much time sitting with the customer so so in our minds we know exactly what we need when we need it uh which is yesterday of course but we we know exactly what we need uh because it's because you'll literally go down the line and have that same conversation hey uh, like, how are you, you know, how are you using our, our time off management or how are you using expense management? You know, what's, uh, what's a challenge that you're facing today? And you used to have that same conversation across like eight or 10 of your customers, eight out of 10 of your customers. And, and you see very clearly, okay, we need this. This is, uh, how much importance they attach to it. This is how, um, this is the problem that we need to solve. Um, like it's 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 crystal clear at that point yeah i think if i'm to summarize our conversation by now uh i will distill three points point number one to build a product especially in the early stage make sure you sit with customers if you yeah. if you are an operator and you enjoy building product maybe vc career is not necessarily something you want to consider at this stage of your life yeah and the third is that it's really, really beneficial to end up in a bigger org such as Kareem or you name it, take any fan company early in your product career, because that's what could lead you to useful connections down the line, who you could yes. potentially start something with, or just yes. ask an advice from, just benefit from their networks as well. Yeah, 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 100%. And I think you can't discount the learning opportunities that come in companies like that. But I would say like, to add to that, just go build something somewhere, a small company, large company, go learn how to do something and do it really, really well. Um, and if you hate it, do something else later, but just get really good at one thing and, and uh, use that as your wedge. Um, 
because otherwise if you're if you're doing like strategy and consulting you you kind of get lost in the ether yeah thanks for this advice and at this stage we normally ask our guests to suggest a piece of content that impacted them quite a bit think a book a podcast a movie uh, a play whatever comes to your mind uh so most recently i was just on holiday and i was reading i'm kind of turned off by i'm kind of turned off by a lot of the the content that you can find online today uh, because it it feels very repetitive so i started going back to the classics and reading uh, a book that kind of dissects the socratic method um so it goes into uh, plato's dialogues um but it does it in like a more um a more practical way and in, in, in a way that you can apply it to life and uh, honestly like i've it's it's reshaping how i think uh and usually it takes me a while to get through you know books that are a little bit denser but i'm flying through this one and it's very 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 relevant to um to product right because it's all about how do you ask questions and how do you understand problems uh and so everybody wants to run to Lenny's podcast or you know you know reading these different blogs that everybody's writing and that that's great and what Paul Graham says is great too but like going back to the core and the root and reading these things i think is really really powerful so I'll, I'll, i forgot i forgot i think the book is called the socratic method but i'll send you the exact one i'm reading because it's it's not the plato's dialogues it's like a, a slightly more digestible version yeah i mean i can so relate to that it feels like whenever you tap into a widely accessible knowledge you keep uh you keep reading the same stuff you keep learning the yeah. same thing and there's no fresh ideas and at some point it's just it's just boring right so i feel Super like boring. whenever you can tap into something that might be a little bit more high level a little bit more conceptual it's actually something that could also change the way you think and there's a reason this literature has been around for 2500 years right there's there's something to it so um yeah i definitely recommend it yeah we should do another one on the uh, philosophical literature at some point all right rayan thanks uh, thanks a lot for making time and thanks for joining us today thank you uh, thank you for having me uh, if you guys are considering moving to Dubai uh, and you want to take an engineering role with Circly, I think you can easily find Ryan on LinkedIn and just uh, yes. give him a ping. I think you've got a few Ukrainians who work there, right? Because most of the folks yes. who yes. listen to uh, it. Have U- yeah, we have Bodan and Roman. Uh, so uh, Bodan is one of our front-end engineers based in Dubai. And Roman is uh, based in Kiev. And uh, he's our designer both rock stars um and we love ukraine so any other ukrainians want to come our way please let us know yeah so so consider this if you're looking for a change anyways uh thanks for, uh, thanks a lot for listening and yeah we'll he- you'll hear us at some point in the future cheers